This is not my notes, but this is where we're going right now. The book of John, chapter 3, I want to just read some scripture, and then we're going to get into an understanding of what God is doing for us. When I was in Bible school 45 years ago, there was a, a man that just kind of hung around the, the campus, and he was a cripple. He had crutches, and he, he, his legs wouldn't move at all. He had to, all of his walking was with his crutches and his arms. And his name was Bob Kozumar. And he was a very, very godly man. He loved the young people in school, and he, he just loved to hang out with the students that were there, and he would pray and pray for each one and come to all of our prayer meetings, and we'd go spend time at his house and drink coffee with him and just kind of hung out with him. But one thing about Bob Kozumar that really I remember even to this day, every time that he was in a service, in a church service or any, anywhere, there was an altar call that was given. He would break down and just begin to weep if it was a call for salvation. And it wasn't because he was getting saved every time, but it was, cause, it was because he was thankful that he had another opportunity to hear the gospel and be saved if he hadn't have been. And he would think back, he said, there's so many people in the world that have never heard the message of salvation. And he said, I've heard it over and over and over and over again, but I'm still thankful every time I hear it. There are many people all over the world that have never heard the good news of the gospel. And we are blessed in this nation, in this land, to be able to show up at any church service anytime we want, just about. Uh, we can turn on the TV and watch it and listen to it on the radio or on the Internet. The gospel being preached all over the world. Jesus said when the gospel is preached into every nation, the end shall come. So we know that the end is upon us. But that being said... The opportunity to preach the gospel is greater than it's ever been before. And our ability and our means to preach the gospel to the world has increased just in an unbelievable way. And in fact, that uh, I'm involved this week in connecting with a group of people in a conference that we are, we're doing online of about uh, 6,000 people that are together and we are, we are, we are listening and we're studying and we're getting an understanding of ways to use the Internet to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to the entire planet. And so this is what I want us to understand tonight. I want you to hear this word. I want you to receive this word. But I also want those that are watching and listening to hear and receive this word. Because the, the amazing thing about the technology that we have today is when a message is preached, it becomes permanent because it's available continually. Since we started doing our website, everything that we've preached is available continually to listen to over and over again and to send out to others. So I'm going to ask you as the body of Christ, members of the body, to pray about sending and sharing those messages because there are people out there that have never heard that need to hear and it's not because of who we are, it's because of who God is and what the Word says. So you just be in prayer about that. And I, and I believe that somebody's going to hear this Word tonight and their lives are going to be changed forever. And I, I'm excited about what God's saying to us. Wow. Let's stand together one more time and pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we yield to you tonight. We yield our hearts, our minds, our bodies. We yield our voice. We yield our words to you. We ask you, Lord, to speak to us and speak through us. Then, Lord, we ask that every word that we hear, may it become a word that, that finds a lodging place in each of our hearts so that we can have that word planted deep in us and that word will remain in us forever. And that word will continue to change us because faith comes by hearing. And we want to continue to hear what you're saying to us. We ask you, Lord, to 
cause this word to produce much fruit. We declare that the enemy cannot and he will not come and steal the seed of this word from us. But this word is going to remain in us. So Lord, we ask you once again to open our hearts. We lay ourselves before you. We ask you just to cut us open with your word and remove from us everything that's not pleasing to you. And then speak to us those things that we need to hear and change us and make us more like you than we've ever been. So Father, thank you for what you're about to do in our hearts tonight. We receive it by faith in Jesus' name. You agree? Say amen. amen. The book of John, chapter number 3, I want to read this. It's the story of, of when Jesus had an encounter with a man by the name of Nicodemus. And most of you, if you've been in church, you know this story. But there's some key parts to this story that we're going to dig into and understand. Because I want to talk to you tonight about what God has offered us. We've been the last few months talking about the, the fact that God said we can have what He has. And there's something that God has that He wants to give to us, and, and we're going to deal with that tonight. It's called His ability. God has an ability that He wants to give to you and I, all right? And it comes through this experience that we're going to read about in John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which born, is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it, is, where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So everyone who was born, so is everyone who was born of the Spirit. Now then, Nicodemus, the Bible says that he was a ruler of the Jews. That means he was a leader of the Jews. That means he had an understanding of the law. He had an understanding of the Jewish traditions. He had an understanding of the teachings of the Old Testament. And yet he did not have an understanding of the Messiah, who he was, and what the message was. And so he came to Jesus and he said, I know that you're a teacher from God. I know that you are a man of God. And the reason I know this is because nobody can do what you're doing unless he is from God. Now there is the power of the gospel. He said to Jesus, no one can do what you're doing unless God gives him that ability to do it, unless God is with him. I want to maybe cause you to begin to think. There's so many things in the Word of God that tell us as the church, the body of Christ, that the works that Jesus did, we can do also. And if we're going to do the works that Jesus did, we're not going to do it in our own ability. We're going to do it in God's ability. And the reason we're going to do that is because God is going to have to be with us. If God's not with us, we don't do it. But if God is with us, we have a testimony of the anointing, the anointed one. We have a testimony of Christ in us, the hope of glory. So what happens when the world, the non-believer, or even the legalistic person, the religious person, sees a lifestyle of victory, a lifestyle of overcoming, a lifestyle of hope, a lifestyle of faith, a lifestyle of joy. They say, you've got to be different. You've got to be of God because you couldn't do what you're doing if God wasn't with you. You see, that should be our testimony. Our testimony to the world is not what we do in a church service. It's not. I mean, we can come and we can shout and dance, have a good time in a church service and feel good about each other and ourselves and God, but it doesn't change the people that we know outside the walls. 
What changes the ones outside the walls are the ones that see that God is with us when we're living in the world. They don't really care about God being with us when we're in church because everybody's spiritual in church. Because in church, you know, we dress a certain way, we act a certain way, we talk a certain way, and we smell a certain way, and, you know, that's the way we are. We're, we're spiritual people. We, it's amazing what we do. It's amazing how we, we, we dress to impress on church on Sunday morning, but we couldn't care what we look like on Monday. But you see, what you look like on Monday and who you talk to on Monday are the people that God's called you to. It doesn't matter what you look like. It's the life that you live. It's the, it's the fruit that you produce with your lifestyle. All right? So that's what Nicodemus saw in Jesus. He saw something different. He saw the miracles. He saw the way that he was living. He saw the things that he was saying and doing. And so Jesus responded to him, and he said to Nicodemus, he said, Unless you're born again, you can't really see what I'm saying. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to make sure you read this properly. Verse 3 says, uh, uh, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He did not say Unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He said, before you can even see the things of the kingdom, you have to be born again. So that simply means you have to have the eye of the Spirit. You have to be born a second time. You have to be born of the Spirit. You have to be what religious people call saved. You see, when you talk to people in the world about being saved, they don't even know what that means. Saved from what? But when you say born again, that has a, a message that is totally beyond natural comprehension, and they need to be, they, they have to receive that by the revelation of the Spirit, because that's what the Spirit does. He brings us into an understanding that we can't keep going like we are. We've got to change. That means we've got to start over. That means we've got to be born again, because the first birth didn't work. Because the first birth, you were born into sin. The first birth, Adam caused all the mess. But the second birth, the second Adam, gives us opportunity to be born a second time, born again. Now, when you're born again, you see things differently. When you're born again, you see the kingdom. You see the principles of the kingdom. You see the, you see the truth of the kingdom. When you're born again, you have an, you have an ability, a God-given ability, because the Word says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. God gives you grace and faith, and grace is the unmerited favor of God, which is the God-given ability. Everybody say God-given ability. So if God says what I have, you can have, let's take hold of what he's given us. He has an ability that we don't have, but he said, I'm going to give it to you. And it's called grace, my ability. My ability. God says, I'm going to place inside of you my ability. That means again, you get born again, you're no longer living by yourself. It's no longer your deal. You don't have to, you don't have to make yourself do anything. All you've got to do is say yes to the Lord because he's going to place his spirit in you and he's going to give you his ability to live above sin, to live in victory, to hear the word, obey the word, his ability to grow in grace, his ability to receive the word, his ability to believe the word, his ability to be an overcomer. That's what being born again is all about. You see, we, we think being born, being, being born again means, well, I'm missing hell, I'm going to heaven. Well, thank God that's part of it. I mean, that means something. I got born again because I had hell scared out of me. I didn't want to go. I didn't and I still don't. That's a good reason to get saved, born again. That's a good reason to make Jesus Lord. That's a good reason. But that's not the reason you stay saved. That's not the reason you continue to grow. Because something happened at the new birth, I forgot about hell. And I focused on heaven. And I forgot about the wrath of God and the judgment of God. And I... 
got a, a revelation of the mercy of God and the grace of God. And now then, because I can see the kingdom of God, I am born again. Now then, I have fallen in love with him because at the new birth, I received grace and faith. God gave me his faith. God gave me his grace. God gave me his ability. So let's just look at a few of these scriptures. You've heard a few of these in the past. Let's look at, at Ephesians chapter number 3, verse number 20. Now, we're talking about God's ability that God says, my ability is yours. Have you ever thought about that? My ability is yours. What I am able to do, I am going to enable you to do. I mean, you read that scripture where Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do also. Anybody read that? The works that I do, you should do also. So if that's, if that's true, then that means that what he's able to do, he wants to enable us to do. Everybody say, God's ability is mine. Mm, boy, you, we may not know what we just said, but we're going to find out because this is what the new birth produces for us. This is a reason. Missing hell is a reason to get saved. But this is a reason to grow in grace because now then, he's going to put his spirit in me and I am going to become a new creation in Christ. Old things are going to pass away. All things are going to become new. And now that I'm no longer living, about, living for yesterday, I'm living for tomorrow, but I'm living in the present by faith knowing what God has given me in my future. So Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him who is able. All right, this tells me something. God is able. Able. Everybody say, God's able. God is able to do anything He wants to, anytime He wants to, anywhere He wants to, anyhow He wants to, past, present, or future. God's able. I mean, God's ability is amazing. God's able to show up when it's dark and say, light be and light is. God's able to show up and create the earth and the first day he creates a morning and the evening and the evening or the evening and the morning of the first day and the evening and the morning of the second day and the evening and the morning of the third day and the evening and the morning of the fourth day. The fourth day he creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. So there was light and dark three days before the sun and the moon and the stars were created. So we judge God's ability by the natural that we judge God's ability by the creation that he made. But I'm here to tell you that God's ability existed before he created anything. So light and dark has nothing to do with the sun, the moon, and the stars. Light and dark has everything to do with God's invasion of his light into darkness. And that's the kingdom. The kingdom of God is light. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So now then we've got this understanding he is able. Now what is he able to do? Well, this word says he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So this tells us now that God has an ability that goes beyond my imagination. God has an ability that goes beyond my understanding. God has an ability to do some things that I have never dreamed possible. And he said, that ability is yours. Because let's read on. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works for in for all right so wow now you've got to be born again to understand this because a natural man can say that doesn't make any sense to me at all but when you get born again, you find out that God wants to equip you and I to be overcomers. See, the purpose of this power is so that we can overcome. It's not so we can be defeated by every trial we have. The purpose of this power is not so we can be overcome by all of our, all of our issues in life and all of our, our, our past sins and all of our past friends and all of our past strongholds. Uh, the purpose of this is not so that we can live our life just barely getting by. The purpose of this is not so that we can just, just hopefully make, make it in by the skin of our teeth. The purpose of this is so that we can be overcomers in everything that we do in this life. Now, that ought to be a reason for you to make Jesus Lord of your life. 
Because if you're tired of being defeated, it's time to become an overcomer. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Let's read this in the Amplified Version. It says, Now to him who by or in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us. Now listen to what he said. This, this is giving us a description now. He is doing something inside of us. When you got born again, the Holy Spirit began to work on the inside of you. Once you said yes to him, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I make you Lord of my life. I repent. I turn from my past. I'm turning to you. The Word of God says that grace and faith was given. It was a gift of God. God gave us his ability and his faith, and he placed it on the inside of us. And then his Holy Spirit moved into us. And this body immediately became his house. Mm. Now then, he lives in me. And in him I live and move and have my being. He lives in me. He's in me. His word is in me. He abides in me and I abide in him. Do you understand that there's, some, there's a connection taking place? There's some changes happening in me. And I am becoming a new creation. I got born again. I'm not the same as I used to be. Old things are gone. It's all brand new. So he says, now, as a result of this, he said, his power that is at work within us, his power is able to carry out his purpose. He's given you and I his power, and because he's given us his power, his power in us is able to carry out his purpose through us. Uh, Y'all going to get that. You're going to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, Oh, I got it. And that's enough to think on for a few days. So His power is in us, and His power is His ability that He's given to us to carry out His purpose. And look at this, and do super abundantly far and above all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. If you haven't made Jesus Lord of your life, maybe you might want to because you can change everything in your future if you do. All right, let's look at, at, at a little bit of how this works now. Because in this revelation of becoming born again, in this understanding of making Jesus Lord of my life, what we term getting saved, we are saved from our past and we are saved into our future in Christ. We're saved from hell. We're saved from sin. We're saved from defeat. We're saved from fear. We're saved from the, the enemy destroying us. We're saved from the power of the thief. And now then we're brought into the kingdom of his dear son. Wow. Now, there are many born-again people that are not reaping the benefits of the kingdom because they're not seeing the kingdom. Jesus said, except you're born again, a man is born again, he cannot see the things of the kingdom. And see, you can get born again and still not look around. Because you've got to look unto Jesus. You've got to focus on him. You've got to look to the word. You've got to get that word in you. When you get that word in you, that word becomes God's ability in you. The word, see, God, Jesus is the word that was made flesh. So you've got to get the Word in you, and when you get the Word in you, you are growing in His ability to be an overcomer. Are y'all catching this? All right, there's something now we've got, to, we've got to understand perception. Perception is everything. Your perception is the thing that you perceive, whether it's true or not true. 
Perception is the thing that you are looking at that you believe is true. The way you perceive things, it determines your outcome. It determines the direction you go. See, religious people perceive God in a box. And so they live their life uh, without victory. They live their life just trying to barely make it through because they've got God in a box. Their perception of God is God up in heaven somewhere, you know, and then we just got to pray and, you know, the heavens are brass and we got we to gotta, we gotta beat the gates of heaven open so we can get in there and talk to God. You know, that's their perception. If, you, if that's your perception, you need to change it because that's not the truth. He's in here. So perception is the thing that you're looking on that causes you to go a certain direction and the way that you perceive it determines your outcome. So if what you see is not what the Word says, close your eyes to what you're seeing and open your eyes to what the Word says. Because your perception really controls how you act. Your perception determines what you do. Your perception of things determines the lifestyle that you live. You see, there are some people that have a perception about their life that they're, you know, they're just a victim. They've been broke all their life. They're going to be broke the rest of their life. They're a victim. They're a victim of circumstances. And they become dependent. They depend on the government. They depend on mom and daddy. They depend on brother and sister. They depend on everybody to give them something. And so we become dependent because their perception of life is, I will never accomplish anything other than what I'm doing right now. And if that's your perception, that's the direction you're going to go. But you have inside of you, if you're born again, you have a God-given ability for your perception to change through hearing the Word and finding out what God says about who you are and what you can do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am an overcomer. I am the head. I'm not the tail. I'm above. I'm not beneath. I'm blessed. I'm not cursed. All my needs are met. According to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Do you understand that there's some things in the Word of God that if you begin to perceive things the way God sees and what God says about you and you change your perception, you will act different than you have been acting because your perception of reality controls how you act. Now look at this statement. You've heard this. I want you to get this in your spirit. If you haven't heard it, make sure you write this one down. Your behavior is determined by the way you perceive the world around you and how you fit into that world. Your behavior. That means the things that you say and the things that you do. Now, when, when I see people that have unusual behavior, and there's a lot of people in the world that their behavior is unusual. And, and, and what we do sometimes when we see people with unusual behavior, we just try to avoid them because... Man, they're weird. They're unusual. And sometimes unusual behavior is because of experiences, you know, and people that have been through things and people that have been addicted to drugs and people that have been uh, addicted to alcohol and people that have lived a rough lifestyle and they, they've been, they've been in, in tragic circumstances and they've been involved in wars. Or they've been, and so the, our behavior now is, is a result of our experiences of our past that have actually uh, made us who we are. Now, sometimes those, those are real issues that have to be dealt with in people because there is only one way to break loose from all of those past conditions of our life, and that's through the miraculous power of the blood of Jesus Christ and being born again. And this is not just a ritual altar call confession. It is a life change when God makes you a new creation. Because you have now then, God says, once you're born again, you can see the kingdom. And he said, when you're born again, I give you my grace. I give you my ability and I give you my faith to change your past. And you can overcome your past and you can live your future in Christ. So my behavior can change. But before it can change, I have got to change the way I perceive the world around me and then how I fit into that world because 
You know, if I feel like I am a failure, that's the way I'm going to fit into my world. But when I find out what God says about me, God doesn't have any failures. God doesn't have any failures. If you're in Christ, you can't fail. Now, you may make some mistakes in yourself, but if you're in Christ, you can't fail. You are an overcomer because the Word of God says, in Him you live and in Him you move and in Him you have your being. All right, now, if that's true about the world we live in, our perception of the world we live in, look at this next statement. Your perception of God determines what you receive from God. Your perception of God determines what you receive from God. So, I've, I've, I've shared, I've, I've taught in the past the understanding that our behavior is a product, it's a produce of what we do with our mind. And so, for us, our perception and our behavior to change, we've got to change the way that we think about some things. And one of the things we've got to change the way we think about is God Himself. Because sometimes we think of God with a religious mindset and don't understand that He's our daddy. He made a way. So your perception of God determines what you receive from God. Hmm, think about that. Many people approach God with a, a mindset that I just don't deserve anything that God has offered me. What God said I can have, he, I, he said I can have it. You know, that preacher's been preaching, I can have what God has, but I don't really think I deserve it. Why? Because your perception of God is God has, it, it is watching you, and he's ready to, to jerk everything away from you if you make a mistake. John chapter 3, verse 16 says, God loves you. If a son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? God loves you. He is for you. He is not against you. All right. So our perception of God has to be accurate. So let's look at these levels. There's three levels of perception I want, you, I want us to deal with. First of all, we have this perception that God is able. Well, we've read the Scripture. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. So now then, we know God is able. Whatever I need, God is able to meet my need. And you know that. How many of you believe that? He's able. God is able. But then we've got to understand that is a, that's the first step in our perception of God. The next step is not only is God able, but God told me in His Word that He will meet my need. So what now I, what now I must do is when I search the Word, I find out what the will of God is. Because the Word says in John, He says, if you, or First John, I believe it is, if you ask anything according to His will, He hears you. So I find the will of God. I know God's able. He said he, would, he's, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all I ask or think. Now then I've got to find out what His will is. So I find the will of God, and I stand in faith. I ask God according to His will, and the Word of God says He hears me. And if He hears me, then I know that I have the petition that I ask of Him. Church, what do you do? Pray, ask, believe. Then you receive. Why? Because I perceive that His Word says He is able, and now I perceive that His Word says that He will. Now, there's a difference in God's will and knowing that He will. Let's see if we can make that understanding. See, a lot of us say, well, God's, I know I know God's will. And so we pray the Lord willing, He will do this. We ask Him to do something, and then we say, if He wills to do it. And what we, the problem is that we don't know the will of God. 
Now, there are some things that you pray about, you may not know the will of God. Paul said, he said on one occasion, he said, you know, you, you say you're going you're gonna to do this and that. You're going to go to this city. You're going to be there tomorrow. He said, you need to add to that the Lord willing because you don't, you don't have a plan from God about your life. So we need to make sure that whatever we say that we're, we are going to do, that if we're going to do it, we need to apply the will of God. If the Lord's willing, then I am going to do it. All right? But it's different when you talk about God. Because God has a will that he's given to us. And if you know his will, you can claim his will. You can proclaim his will. And you can prophesy his will. You can pray his will. You can believe his will. And you can do his will. So there's a difference in knowing that God will and then knowing the will of God. Once you get the revelation of the will of God, then you can know that God will. Are y'all comprehending that? The next level of understanding. Let's go, let's go to this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this reason also, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Okay. I need to be filled with the knowledge of His will. And in case you're not aware of where you can find that, y'all want to do a Google search and find the will of God? See, it's so amazing the world we live in. You know, just, you have a question. Well, let me just, let me look, let me look it up. Let me look it up. You're, you know, you can find Trivial pursuit is not the same as it used to be now. You just look it up on the phone. Oh, I got the answer. It's right here. Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, you do now. You, you know, Google told you. You don't find the will of God on the Internet unless you're studying a Bible. Because here's the will of God. It is called the New Testament. The New Testament is simply the new will of God. It is the revised will from the old will to the new will. The Old Testament to the New Testament. And so if you're wanting to know the will of God, he said, my prayer for you is that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in wisdom and spiritual understanding. So he's saying, what my prayer for you is that you know the word of God with understanding and wisdom. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the understanding of the word of God. So when you get that in you, you find you've got the will of God. Now, what we look at when we say God is able, we're saying, well, I know he can, I know he, I know he can. And then we get this understanding that I know that God will. And so we still have this, this comprehension, well, he will. A will is something that past tense has already been established. We have a will. You know, your will is a past tense experience. You have already established your will past tense. It's in your past, and it will be fulfilled when you leave this world. And you hope that your kids don't fight over it. But you have already past tense established your will. So will is past tense. It's previously established. So what we need to do now when we're going to get to know the will of God, oh, this is where the revelation is going to come to you now. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. Something is going to happen now that is going to cause his power to start to work in me. And that is my perception of who he is and what his will is. His will now is no longer a future tense experience. People are still searching for the will of God. I just hope that I can find the will of God for my life. I've had throughout the years, young ministers would come to me and say, you know, I, don't, I, I just don't know how to find the will of God. And their, 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 their question is, you know, I don't know 
what, if I'm supposed to go pastor a church somewhere, if I'm going to be supposed to go on the mission field somewhere, or, or I don't know what kind of mystery that I'm going to have. I just don't know the will of God. And I have an answer every single time. It's very simple. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, 2, and 3. That's the will of God. The will of God for every born-again believer, no matter what your calling is, the will of God for every born-again believer is found in Romans chapter 12, 1, 2, and 3. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What's the will of God for your life? Right now, hear the word, do it. Don't worry about tomorrow. Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow what you're going to eat or drink or what the clothes you're going to wear. He said, deal with your stuff you've got to deal with today. The will of God today is be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, if you don't know the will of God for your life, find out what the Word of God says for you to do right now, today. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when you get your mind renewed to the Word of God, and what are you doing? You are perceiving His will. You're taking hold of His will that has already been established. God made your will before the beginning began. He knew you in the very beginning, and He knew your future. And He made a will. He says, now I want you to know that I am able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think because I have already made your will, and all you've got to do is learn what that will is. And when you learn the will, you have power to receive the benefit of the will. When you, you see, if you're great uncle died and he was a multi-millionaire and your name was in the will and he left you a cattle ranch and you didn't know about it you could still live in your shack the rest of your life the will has been established but bound and destroyed to the lack of knowledge. The will of God is established for your life, but many people are living in bondage and living in destruction because they don't know the will of God. Not only has the will been established, it has already been published, and all you have to do is take it by faith, receive, believe that it's for you. Now, once you receive notification of the will. You're going to find your way to that courthouse as soon as you possibly can. You're going to say, where do I sign my name? Where do I come into covenant with my great uncle that's dead and gone, bless his soul? Never even met him. I hope he's in heaven, but I'm glad he gave me a ranch, right? So what we do now, we have to be empowered. What we are empowered to do is with knowledge, this ranch belonged to me. I mean, I, it's, it's in my great uncle's will, and my name is there, and all I've got to do is go and claim what he has already given to me. Too many people are saying, well, I just wish I knew the will of God. Well, open up the will and read it and find out what it says for you. Because, you see, there's some things that God says you can have that you don't even know about yet. There's some promises that God's given to us that we're not even receiving yet because we don't have knowledge of them. But once you have knowledge of them, you find out that this will is not a future tense experience. I'm not having to pray for the will of God for my future. The will of God is for me to obey God today, period. One day at a time, hear the voice of God, do what God says, get into His Word, let His Word speak to you, let His Word change you, and what's going to happen? You're going to mature, you're going to grow, and then, his, then your steps are going to be ordered by the Lord. And when your steps are ordered by the Lord, you find favor in the eyes of God, find favor in the eyes of men. God opens doors that, that have never been opened before, he, and He opens the door that no man can shut, He shuts the doors no man can open. Why? What are you doing? You're just reading the will and doing it. I'm claiming what God's offered to me, exceedingly abundantly above all that I've ever dreamed of. It's in the will. I'm finding out now that I'm a blessed person. I have a great inheritance. I've got some stuff that I can use that I didn't know I had. But now then, I found the will, and He's given me everything that pertains to life and godliness. Romans 3.24. Here's what God has done. This has already been established. Not only is He able, not only will He, but He already has. 
being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his, in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. All right. In God's past tense will, in the old covenant, what God did, the day of atonement, the day of judgment, the day of wrath would show up, and it would either be a day of wrath or a day of mercy, depending on the sacrifice that was offered. But God basically postponed judgment for all the sins of the previous year. And then when they came on the day of atonement, if the sacrifice was pure, God would forgive the past tense sins. All right? And then they'd have to go another year. And they couldn't live above sin no matter how hard they tried. But because of God's grace and his forbearance, he passed over the sins that had been previously committed. He said, I want to give them another chance. I want to give them another chance. Now look at verse 26. To demonstrate at this present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Oh, okay, hold on. That will, now then, we understand that everything in the old was completed at Calvary. And the new now is more glorious. And the new covenant has made a way so that you and I can be justified simply by believing. Pay attention. You don't have to offer a bull, a goat, a lamb, a turtle dove, nothing. All you've got to do is believe. And if you believe, you can receive. Uh, Romans 5, 9, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What God has given to us is simply his ability to live a life in complete, absolute victory. Now, I've got a number of scriptures, and I'm not going to read all of them, but I'm going to get, I want you to get the gist of this. Galatians 3.27, it says, Many of you, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now, what happened when you came into, you got born again, you were baptized into him by faith, now your new life began living in Christ, and the life that we live now, we live according to the faith that God's given us as a new creation. Stop living as an old dead man when you claim to be born again. Live as a new creation. Live as a righteous person. Live the way Jesus said you could live. All right. All these scriptures, I'm not going to take time to read them, but Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians and Hebrews and uh, First and Second Peter, we find all these verses that talk about what has already happened for us. So the message to receive tonight is simply this. God has already taken care of everything pertaining to your salvation. And all we have to do is believe it and receive it by faith. And he is so good that he said, I know you can't do this on your own. So I'm going to give you my ability. And with my ability, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you. I just want to say I thank you for the good news of the gospel. I want to thank you for the privilege we have of hearing, believing, and receiving what you have already done for us. Lord, we know in ourselves we can't do anything. We're, we, we have no value whatsoever, but in you we can do all things. Lord, my prayer right now is for anyone that may be in this room or anyone that's watching online or anyone that's listening, either today or sometime in the future, that your Holy Spirit will speak to each and every heart. 
I ask you, Lord, to speak to that one that simply needs to say, I give up. Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. I want to be born again so I can see the kingdom. I want to see these principles. I want to see this, this ability and this lifestyle to live in victory and not be defeated anymore. I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. Wow. Speak to our hearts, Father. Speak to our hearts. I'm going to ask everybody, if you can, right where you're standing, just to raise your hands to Him as a sign of surrender. I'm going to ask that person that's watching online right now, wherever you are, if you can, just raise your hands and say, Lord, I give up. And then just say these words. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for your love. I receive it right now. I give up and I turn my life over to you. I repent of my past. I repent of all sin. I make you Lord of my life. I receive your ability to do what you've called me to do. I make you Lord of every thought, every feeling, every emotion. I make you Lord of my past, of my present, and of my future. I ask you, Father, right now to be my daddy and to renew my mind because I'm in your family. Your blood's been applied and I'm forgiven. I'm a new creation. I'm born again and I see the kingdom and I do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, do you understand that that is just another opportunity? We've heard the gospel and we've received the gospel. Now then you're empowered with the message of the gospel to go and tell somebody else. Don't ever condemn anybody for anything. Love them into the kingdom of God. Show the mercy and grace to everyone and let God use you. Now, I know some of you last night you prayed. How many of you prayed and read the scripture in Job 33, 14? Raise your hand. 33, 14 or 18. I want you to do that again tonight. There's those people that you talked to today. There's those people that you prayed for today that God's still working on. You don't give up. You press on in. You become the mediator. You become the go-between between them and the grace of God so that they can receive His mercy. All right? Father, we thank You for the privilege we have of being a part of Your family. You've called us, You've chosen us, and You're using us for Your glory. So, Lord, we ask You to go before us. We ask You, Lord, to minister to hearts that we're concerned about, that we're praying for. And we ask You, Lord, to use us in some way to make a difference, to reveal Your love to them so their lives can be changed. Thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.